Hi everybody, uh, this is Mrs. Burke. This is video number 60B. Uh, this again is going to be a movie from uh, the Discovery Channel from their series From the Universe. Uh, again, I will have notes that come in on the arrows or the little circles on the annotations. Uh, take good notes. Uh, you're going to need to answer some questions uh, at the end that I will give you. Enjoy! The sun is the superpower of our solar system. A thermonuclear blast furnace erupting with massive explosions. It can be the same amount of mass as Mount Everest coming out from the sun and flying out into space. At 93 million miles away, it would seem that we're safe from the sun's wrath. But are we? It matters, especially in modern times, what the sun is doing. From the center of the sun, as it rotates around, is the kill zone. With some experts predicting the most violent outbreak of solar activity in modern history, it's never been more important to understand the secrets of the sun. There are billions of stars in the universe, but one alone dominates our cosmic neighborhood the sun. It's an infernal sphere of mostly hydrogen and helium, superheated into a plasma that burns at millions of degrees. Its surface rages with violent explosions as it spews out storms of deadly radiation millions of miles into space. Our sun is a type of star known as a yellow dwarf. Yellow because of the color of its surface, and dwarf because it's small for a star. But small is relative. Within its boundaries, you could fit one million Earths. In our solar system, there's simply no bigger star than the Sun. At a million miles across, it's a massive celestial blockbuster. The Sun is really pretty huge. It dominates our solar system. Not only is it the biggest star in the solar system, it's the only star in the solar system. It's surrounded by a bunch of smaller stuff that we call planets and comets and moons. But the sun is our star. Our star is an enormous source of heat and energy. It has a surface temperature of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit and generates 380 billion billion megawatts of power. This dwarfs anything on the human scale. Hoover Dam in Nevada only generates 2,080 megawatts. In one second, the sun churns out more energy than has been used in all of human civilization. All that power in the blink of an eye. Incredibly, it's been burning this way for billions of years. Early astronomers didn't quite understand how the sun could generate so much energy for that long a period of time. That was the first mystery, was really how the sun generates its energy. In the early 19th century, scientists assumed that the sun worked just like any fire on Earth, that there was a source of fuel, perhaps coal, that was slowly burning away. But there was a serious problem with this theory. I've got a fire in front of me here. If I wanted to keep burning, I have to keep adding wood to it. This fire will last maybe an hour, unless I add some more wood. Now, if I had a pile of wood the size of the whole sun, and somehow enough oxygen to burn it, it would only take about five or 6,000 years to burn out. That's a long time, but it's not long enough to sustain life on Earth. By the early 20th century, carbon dating of Earth rocks and fossils had proven that the sun was in existence and at temperatures warm enough to sustain life not for thousands of years but for three billion if you wanted to build a fire that would last that long you would need 72 trillion cords of firewood that's 12,000 cords for each man woman and child on the planet clearly there had to be some other process unknown on earth that was powering the sun in the 1920s, scientists found the answer to the puzzle in a process that would later be harnessed to fuel the hydrogen bomb, nuclear fusion. Fusion occurs when atoms are smashed together at a high rate of speed and literally fused. To get this to happen, conditions have to be just right. 
for any interaction to happen, these two protons each has a positive electric charge, and so they would repel each other. So you've got to get them close enough together. And to do that, it's got to be hot, which means the particles move very fast, and dense enough that they, they hit each other, and they can get close enough together that they actually fuse. The core of the sun is the perfect cauldron for nuclear fusion. It's the hottest place in the solar system, at a sweltering 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. And it's also incredibly dense. It's so dense, it's 10 times the density of lead. And you would think at that density it should be a solid, but it's not because it's so hot that it remains a plasma. If you heat a gas to high enough temperatures, electrons fall off of the atoms and they float around in the soup. And so it has behavior that's different from what a gas would do. And so we have a different word for it, we call it plasma. To truly understand what goes on in the core of the sun, you have to find some way to imagine the almost unimaginable. In addition to studying the sun, I also play pool. And the sun is a place where there are billions of particles colliding and interacting with each other. And it's really not unlike a cosmic pool table on an unimaginable scale. It doesn't matter how hard you hit a ball. You would never hit it hard enough to actually fuse that ball together with another ball. But there's so much pressure and such high density at the core of the sun that the two objects impacting each other will actually fuse. In the sun, these objects are hydrogen atoms flung together by immense pressure to form helium atoms. In this fusion process, the resulting atom is slightly less massive than the ones that created it. The missing mass is given off as energy. Each second inside the sun, 600 million tons of hydrogen are fused into 595 million tons of helium. That 5 million tons of mass lost in the process is converted into energy equal to 1 billion 1 megaton hydrogen bombs. That's every second. When you look out into the cosmos, the process that gives you the highest return of energy for free is what goes on in the centers of stars like the sun. So we now know that the sun is powered by nuclear fusion. It's the only fuel that we know that can sustain the burning in the sun long enough to sustain life on Earth, billions of years. Sunlight. It's so central to life that we don't often give it a second thought. But how light gets from there to here turns out to be an incredible story. The energy created in the fusion process is carried out of the core by particles of light and heat called photons. They are what bring the warming rays of the sun to Earth. To reach our planet, these glowing travelers from our nearest star must first take a long winding road through all the layers of the sun, like Dante journeying through the levels of hell. First, a photon enters the 185,000 mile thick radiative zone. The region is so densely packed that the photon constantly bumps into other particles, like hydrogen and helium atoms. It struggles outward in a chaotic zigzag pattern that scientists call the random walk. A photon can't escape without interacting over and over and over and over again, getting absorbed by atoms and re-emitted, and it can be absorbed and re-emitted millions of times. As the density decreases, as you get further up in the sun, it becomes easier, and the collisions and the interactions are less. When it finally reaches to within 130,000 miles of the surface, the photon enters the convective zone, and the pace suddenly quickens. It's carried upwards by a kind of boiling, riding along in huge columns of gas at hundreds of miles an hour, taking only 10 days to emerge on the solar surface. The incredible journey is almost over as the photon lifts off through the wispy gases of the solar atmosphere. From there, it takes only eight minutes for it to zip across 93 million miles of space to our planet. In 
Incredibly, by the time sunlight actually reaches Earth, it's already been in existence for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of years. For the sun, even a million years is a small blip in time. The simple, perfect disk of a sunset belies the long, violent history of our star. It is a ball of fire spawned billions of years ago in a massive explosion known as a supernova. After this titanic explosion where a star much larger than the sun exploded, there would have been a huge cloud of gas, many times larger than the solar system. And small knots of material would have gradually coalesced in this very large cloud. About 5 billion years ago, some 10 billion years after the Big Bang that scientists believe kick-started our universe, this cloud started to collapse under the pull of gravity. Our solar system probably arose from one such knot of self-gravitating gas that pulled itself together and gradually spun itself up as it pulled in, like a skater pulling her arms in during a spin, uh, until the star and the various planets coalesced around it. Ultimately, when the star was dense enough, it would have turned on fusion and started glowing, giving off sunlight. Why do scientists believe the sun was born from the ashes of a supernova? The evidence lies beneath our feet. Complex, heavy elements like the uranium we mine from the Earth to fuel our nuclear power plants could not have been forged in the sun. There is simply not enough heat in a star that size to create elements any heavier than iron. Heavy elements like uranium can only be created in a catastrophic cosmic explosion. Earth and the other planets in the solar system formed out of the same knot of gas that produced the sun. In this process, the sun hoarded 99% of the mass. This means it's the biggest object in our celestial neighborhood with the strongest gravitational pull. That's why everything else revolves around it. Of all the planets, Earth earned a privileged place in relation to the sun. If we were closer in, our oceans would boil away and the ground would be hot enough to melt lead. If we were farther out, our planet would be a frozen wasteland. Sort of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Not too hot, not too cold, it's just right. Here we are at about 93 million miles away from the sun and we're uh, happy to be here, we're lucky to be here. In some sense we're here because it's the right circumstance for us to be here. Earth may be in just the right place in the solar system, but we're also close enough to the sun to be a target of its fury. Thousands of mammoth explosions rock our sun every year. You might expect this explosive force to come from nuclear reactions in the core. But in reality, what drives all outbursts of solar violence is magnetism. Since Earth rotates as a solid, our magnetic field is simple. We have two poles, north and south. This is what makes a compass so useful for finding your way around the planet. But imagine if instead of two poles, you had one to ten million. This is what happens on the sun. The sun's magnetic field is a tangled web because even though it's held together by gravity, the plasma doesn't rotate evenly. Plasma at the equator rotates once every 25 Earth days, while plasma at the poles takes roughly 35 days to circle once. The sun has what we call differential rotation. You have all of this plasma that is really turning and churning, and that causes magnetic field lines to become twisted and intertwined and mixed up. Although magnetic field lines are invisible, we know they exist on the sun by looking at features called coronal loops and prominences rising up into the solar atmosphere. Just as metal shavings line up in the presence of a simple magnet, these loops of plasma perfectly outline the magnetic structures that support them from below. These plasma arches are so tall and wide that you could slide a planet as big as Jupiter right through them. 
Sometimes magnetic fields can twist plasma in the sun's atmosphere into majestic helical shapes called flux ropes. Magnetic flux rope is sort of like a slinky. The magnetic field line is wrapped around many times in a helical structure. And when you have highly twisted magnetic field lines, it carries a lot of stored free magnetic energy. And sometimes it will even kink in on itself, which gives it even more stored magnetic free energy. These plasma prominences can last for weeks or months, but eventually the stored up energy has to be released and the mass is flung off into space. Where the sun's magnetic field is at its most twisted and complex, heat bubbling up from below is capped and the material is cooled by as much as a thousand degrees. What results are relatively dark blemishes on the solar surface called sunspots. Sunspots are only dark in relation to the bright material around them. If you could somehow suspend one alone up in space, it would shine ten times brighter than the full moon. These apparently tiny blemishes are actually plasma craters the size of the entire Earth. Galileo was one of the first modern scientists to observe sunspots. Using a telescope, he projected an image of the sun onto paper and traced it. He realized that the blemishes were moving across the face of the star, which was the first indication that the sun rotated. Not only does the sun rotate, but sunspots themselves can actually spin like hurricanes on the solar surface. And when they do, their magnetic field lines become extremely twisted. Twisted magnetic field lines mean more energy, and more energy means the potential for huge eruptions. Think of a rubber band as a magnetic field line. If you twist it, and you twist it enough, it's going to have all that energy, and when you let it go, it's going to release. If you just take an untwisted rubber band and release it, it's not going to fly. When a sunspot unleashes its magnetic energy, what results are the most colossal explosions in the solar system? Solar flares. A single flare releases as much as a billion megatons of energy, the combined power of a million volcanic eruptions on Earth. They appear as these very bright regions, and they're so bright because the temperature is so high, on the order of 10 million degrees. And they can last for hours, but the energy is massive. The whole explosion is equivalent to millions of nuclear bombs leaving the surface of the sun all at once. Solar flares don't just explode out into space. They also funnel high energy particles down to a layer of the sun called the chromosphere, where they quickly transfer their energy, like a cue ball striking the rack in a game of billiards. So the cue ball acts like one of these very high energetic particles coming from the flare region. The cue ball smacks very quickly into the A-ball rack. And once it impacts that head ball, it's going to transfer that energy to the balls behind it, and then they will all fly out because the energy is transferred to all of them. If a large flare shoots enough high energy particles at once, strange things start to happen. This is actual footage of a sunquake. In 1998, there was a solar flare up in the corona that was so powerful that the material flying down toward the surface of the sun actually slapped the surface and caused ripples to spread out from there. While they may look like ripples on a pond, these are actually waves two miles high traveling at a maximum velocity of 250,000 miles per hour. The 1998 sunquake would have measured an 11.3 on the Richter scale, more than one million times stronger than the 1989 earthquake that shook San Francisco. In order to shake the surface of the sun that much, the solar flare had to release a colossal amount of energy. It turns out it's almost the same amount of energy as if you covered the entire landmass of the Earth with dynamite. 
about a yard thick and set it all off at once. So these explosions are not small. Earthquakes aren't the only natural disasters with equivalents on the sun. A flare can also kick off a solar tsunami as waves of plasma in the sun's atmosphere rocket out at 700,000 miles per hour, spreading around the entire face of the star in a matter of hours. While sunquakes and solar tsunamis pose no danger to Earth, the violent action of a flare frequently triggers dangerous eruptions called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. In a CME, energy from a flare flings a blob of highly charged radioactive plasma out of the solar atmosphere. Coronal mass ejections range in speeds, but they can occur as quick as 800, 900 miles per second, which is extremely fast. and they expel a massive amount of material. It can be the same amount of mass as say Mount Everest coming out from the sun and flying out into space. Where does this blob of superheated radioactive plasma go when it leaves the sun? Sometimes it sails out harmlessly into space. Other times it may head closer to home. Coronal mass ejections from the sun are perhaps the most dangerous threat you've never heard of. Also known as solar storms, they hurl large masses of supercharged particles across 93 million miles of space. Most take several days to travel from the sun to the earth, but some rocket across the solar system at up to 6 million miles an hour, reaching our planet in less than 16 hours. These storms can induce currents in the outer atmosphere, knocking out satellites and cross-country power grids, and carry the potential to wreak just as much havoc on our infrastructure as a hurricane or tornado. But who on Earth is keeping an eye on these potentially hazardous cosmic blasts? This is the headquarters of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, home to the U.S. government's National Weather Service. Their daily forecasts, watches, and warnings are essential information for everyday life on our planet. But there's a lesser known group of forecasters working here in a special division called the Space Environment Center. Our primary job is to monitor the sun and to put out the alerts and watches and warnings for solar activity. 